Hi everybody, uh, this is John Tabor again, coming to you with chapter two of the uh, All-in-One CompTIA IT Fundamentals Plus exam guide. This is specifically for the U61 version of the IT Fundamentals exam. And we're going through the next chapter, which is based on system hardware. Now, if you remember from chapter one, we talked about how chapter one was kind of a sampler platter, a little bit of everything that this course will be offering. It's just a very shallow version of a little bit of everything. And then today, starting with this chapter, we're going to go down a little bit deeper into each topic that we introduced and each topic that the IT Fundamentals exam will cover. Again, this IT Fundamentals uh, exam course book is brought to you by Total Seminars, written by Scott Jernigan and Mike Myers, and this will be um, dealing with system hardware here in Chapter 2. Now, our course objectives that we're going to be covering in Chapter 2, uh, we will learn how to differentiate among CPUs in terms of speed and features. We'll explain the types and technologies of memory in a PC. We'll descri uh, describe motherboard form factors and features, and also identify the purpose and functions of a power supply. There are five main system hardware pieces that we're going to be focusing on. There's obviously a lot more to a computer than just these five, but these five are the most important to know in terms of the IT Fundamentals Plus exam. So let's get started. This is Chapter 2, System Hardware. Now, one thing to understand is that Data flows in and out of a computer using really a three-step process. You have input, you have processing, and you have output. Now, input are instructions sent by you, the user, through either a mouse or a keyboard. Every time you click on a mouse or type, in a, type on a button on a keyboard, you're sending information into the computer, and that is input. That is anything that you send into the computer, usually by a keyboard or a mouse or some sort of other input device. Processing is what the computer does. It's the operation performed by the computer according to the input. When you click on a, a mouse or you type on the keyboard, you're sending information into the keyboard and it will process and do what it's supposed to according to your instructions, according to your commands. That is processing. Output is the result of the operation delivered back to us. So we're putting information into the computer, that's input, it does what it's supposed to do, it processes that data, and then it spits out the information to us. That is output. Now another part of this, which isn't really part of the three-step process, is storage. Now this is also an internal part of your computer, the hardware, it can also be external, uh, but it's something that would store the data that you inputted into the computer. But we're going to be dealing with mostly uh, the five major parts of hardware, which deal with input processing and output. So the first one that we're going to cover is uh, our CPU. CPU is the central processing unit. It's sometimes referred to as the processor or the microprocessor. If you open up a computer, you will see this big square or rectangular it might be green, it usually is. This one in this picture is black. It's called the motherboard. Now the motherboard is another piece of hardware that we're going to talk about later on in more detail. But on this motherboard, you will see this part of the motherboard which has a chip. Now sometimes this is hidden uh, by something else that we're gonna talk about later on. But, in, but plugged into this motherboard is a chip, also called the CPU. It is the central processing unit. Uh, and this chip it basically runs the operations of what's happening. It, help, it determines how fast a computer can be based on uh, the uh, speed, the features, and the efficiency of this central processing unit. There are two main types of a central processing unit. You have the Intel chip. You might have seen commercials for it. Pentium processor is an Intel processor. And you also have an AMD chip. Now there's most people, the general public, some people love Intel, some people love AMD. It just depends on who you are. All right, it's basically like, do you like Coke? Do you have like Pepsi? It depends on who you are and your personal preference. Uh, Inside of the different types of computers that you have, it really depends on what, you, what you're dealing with. If you have a desktop computer, there's various kinds of chips that you can use, and it really depends on your system. If you have a laptop computer, you're typically going to be using a Core Duo CPU. Uh, if you have a tablet computer, you're usually going to be using an Atom CPU. 
A mobile computer uses an ARM, which is an advanced risk machine CPU. And then if your server either has a 32-bit or a 64-bit um, server, then you're going to either use an Opteron CPU for 32-bit or a EM64T CPU for a 64-bit. Now, a lot of that information you don't need to know for the exam, so don't worry about that. But that's just great information to know as we get closer and understanding these CPUs a little bit better. Now, CPUs can be different speeds. And when we talk about the speed of a CPU, you know, when we talk about the speed of a car, we're talking about miles per hour, kilometers per hour. For a CPU, it's measured in cycles or it's measured in hertz. The measurement of a CPU is by how many operations it can do in one second. And that is represented by a hertz or a cycle. So a hertz represents one cycle. A megahertz represents a million cycles. And a gigahertz can represent a billion cycles. Now, modern CPUs typically are measured in gigahertz. As you can see over here on the side, 1.5 to 4 gigahertz. So we're saying that a, a normal CPU in somebody's house can do one, one and a half billion cycles all the way up to 4 billion cycles per second. That's crazy. Uh, but that is how the CPUs are now, and they're going to do nothing but continue to get faster and faster as computers become more and more powerful and more and more efficient. Some CPU features that we're going to talk about is 64, the first one is 64-bit computing. Now, this typically, this used to be 32-bit computing, and and now they've moved to 64-bit computing. And here's the difference between the two. A 32-bit computing computer could handle numbers up to 4 billion, which was great. But that number slowly has become smaller, and it can't handle more and more and more that we want to do with a computer. So the technologists out there and the computer experts out there developed a 64-bit computing CPU. Now, it seems like between a 32 and a 64, you're just doubling it, right? If you take 2 times 32 is 64, so this is twice as powerful as before. Not the case. This is actually billions of times. If you have a 32-bit computer and you double the processing power, you're actually now at 33-bit. And you double it again, you're at 34-bit. So it's being doubled 32 times to get to 64. So just to give you a little bit of um, an idea of what we're talking about, a 32-bit computer, as we mentioned, let me write this out down here, a 32-bit computer could handle 4 billion, that's 4 million, there we go. It could handle 4 billion uh, numbers at any one point one time. When we talk about a 64-bit, we're talking about not double this. 64-bits can handle 18.4 quintillion, which means, let's see if I can do this right. Let's see, that'd be 18 billion. So this would be 18 trillion, this would be 18 quadrillion, this would be 18 quintillion. So there is a huge difference between a 32-bit and a 64-bit um, CPU. And obviously a 64-bit is billions of times more complex than the other one. The other way that CPUs can handle information is using some, some different number notations. And we're gonna explore these on the, on the next couple of slides. Decimal, binary, and hexadecimal. Decimal, you're probably used to. Decimal is base 10, and it's used in common math. Binary is base two, and, we only, and it's representing some sort of on or off state. Hexadecimal is base 16, and it's a way that you can present large numbers using a very few digits. So we're going to explore all these, and hopefully you'll be a little bit more of, uh, knowledgeable of how to, how to deal with and what these, need, what these mean. So let's start with decimal. Now decimal notation, as you mentioned already, is actually 
a base 10. Now, what does base 10 mean? That means that we're going to be dealing with powers of 2. So we have like 10 to the 3rd, 10 to the 2nd, 10 to the 1st, 10 to the 0, 10 to the negative 1st power, 10 to the negative 2nd power, and it can go both directions forever. Now, base 10 means that you have 10 numbers that you're dealing with. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. There are 10 different numbers, and that's what we see every day. When we see some sort of number out there, let's say we have uh, 326.47, okay? There are actually five, in this particular number, there are five different numbers involved. They're all using these 10 numbers from up here, but they're all in a different, what we call a place value. And each of these represents a power of 10. Now, the one directly next to the decimal to the left is our ones position. This is our tens position. This is our 100s position. This is our tenths position, not to be confused with tens. And this one is our uh, one hundredths position. So this is the same thing as three times a hundred. This three is in the hundreds position. So it's three times a hundred, which is a three hundred and something. Plus the two is how many tens? The six is how many ones? The four is how many tenths? And the seven is how many one hundredths? So this is 300 plus 20 plus six plus 0.4 plus 0.07. And if you add all that up, we get 326 0.47. So again, this is the old way of having, having to come up with each one of those digits, but that's what it means whenever we put these together. They all represent a different place value. One is more powerful than the next, right? Because 10 to the zero is represents one. 10 to the first is 10. 10 to the second is 100. 10 to the third is 1,000. You know, if I would have had another number out here, this would have been in the thousands position. This represents 0.1 and 0.01, and so on and so forth. So base 10 is any kind of number as we work that out. Okay, so it's all based in 10 digits, and that's, again, what normal math and normal things are, are based on. So, again, it's not a big deal, but we're going, the next two are a little bit uh, crazier because we're dealing with something else. Now, binary, remember that uh, decimal notation, let's go back real quick, Decimal notation, DEC is a prefix meaning 10. Like um, decade is 10 years. So base 10. The prefix of BI represents the fact that this is base 2. Now with base 2, we don't have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We just have two numbers, and that is a 0 and a 1, and that's it. 0 and 1. Now, these are based on powers of 2. So we have like 2 to the 5th, 2 to the 4th, 2 to the 3rd, 2 to the 2nd, 2 to the 1st, and 2 to the 0. Now, 2 to the 0 is the same as 1. Anything to the power of 0 is 1. 2 to the 1st is 2. And you'll see a pattern here. 2 to the 2nd is 4. 2 to the 3rd is 8. 2 to the 4th is 16, 2 to the 5th is 32, and I could have kept going this way as well, 2 to the 6th, 2 to the 7th, but look at our pattern. As we go to the right, we're multiplying by 2. It's being doubled. In the world of computers, it's all about doubling, 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 and these numbers you're going to see a lot. The, the 8, the 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, and so on. So you're being doubled each time. So if we are trying to come up with a binary notation, let's go both ways. You know, a binary notation has place values, just like the decimals did. OK, 
Okay, let's just do a number of one, one, zero, zero, one. I'm just putting ones or zeros into this random blank and trying to figure out what we get. Now, here's what this means. The first blank or the first number on the far right are always the ones digit. This is then the twos digit, and then we double. This is the fours digit, this is the eights digit, and this is the sixteens digit. We saw those numbers over here. So what does this mean? This one represents that there is one sixteen, so sixteen plus. This one represents there's one eight, eight plus. Now we actually ignore the zeros. There's no fours, there's no twos, so I just skip those. But then this one, there's one, one. So if you take 16 plus eight plus one, this represents 25. One, one, zero, zero, one. 25 is in, let me write this out. 25 is how we would write it in decimal notation, but 11001 is how we would write it in binary notation. All right, let's go the other way. What if we had a number such as, oh, 45? 45, we wanted to write it into binary notation. So first off, we look at our numbers. This is 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. This would have been like a 64 here. 45 fits here. It's between 32 and 64. So we don't use the 64 because it's too big. We do have 32. So I'm going to write my, my blanks. This is 1, this is 2, this is 4, this is 8, and this is 16. And I'm going to go to 32. 45, if I went to 64, again, that's too big, so I'm not going to use that one. 45 is does have a 32 within it, so I'm going to put a 1 here. Now I would subtract 32 from it and see what's left. I have a 13. Now, 16 is too big. 30, 30, 13, uh, there is not a 16 that goes into 32. Remember, I said 32 does go into 45. 13 uh, is left. 16 does not go into that. That's too big. 8, though, I can subtract 8 from this. So 8 fits. There's a 1 here. 4 fits. There's a 1 here. What I have left here is 1. 2 doesn't fit into that, so we're not going to have any 2, but 1 fits into that once. So sorry, it's really messy. 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. That's binary notation for 45. This is decimal, this is binary. So you're trying to figure out what power of 2 can fit into that number, and we go through that. Feel free to Google online. There's lots of tutorials available on YouTube uh, where you can identify and you can learn binary a little bit better. All right, and the last one we'll talk about is hexadecimal. Now, hex means six, but des means 10. So this is actually a base 16. Now, for base 16, we are using more than just 10 different values. We're using more than just two different values. We're using 16 different values. So we're going to use the ones we're, we're used to. We're going to use 0, 1, 2, three, four, what happened to five? Five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Those are normal stuff. We're also going to use more than that because that actually represents 10 digits. Zero through nine is 10 digits. We're also going to use the letter A, B, C, D, E, and F. Now A stands for 10, B stands for 11, C stands for 12, D stands for 13, E stands for 14, and F stands for 15. But John, I thought you said 16 numbers. There are 16 numbers. It's just that zero is counted as one. If you count up the number of numbers or letters here, you will get 16. So instead of using the numbers 10 through 15, we're using A through F. Okay, so 
we need to remember that our place values are powers of 16. This first one is 16 to the 0, which is a 1. This next one is 16 to the 1st, which is 16. This next one is 16 to the 2nd. 16 times 16 is 256. And this one is 16 to the 3rd, which is 16 times 16 times 16, which is 4096. Again, there's a little bit of math involved here, so feel free to get a calculator out if you need it as we go through this. Now let's say we have, I'm going to have two, two places here. I'm just gonna use one of my symbols up here, either zero through nine or A through F. Let's do um, five, no, let's do C4. C4 is like dynamite, but what would this be as a regular decimal number? C4 is a hexadecimal notation. So remember, this first one is our ones position. This is our 16s position. So this is the same thing. C represents 12. So this is actually like a 12 here. So there are 12 16s, 12 times 16 plus four times one. So we would work this out. If you take 12 times 16, we're gonna get 160, 32, 192, plus four times one is four. So this is the same thing as 196. C4 is binary, excuse me, C4 is hexadecimal for the number, the decimal number of 196. All right, let's do another one. Let's do a three digit one this time. Now again, you pick any one of these up here. Uh, I'll just pick uh, seven uh, E two. All right, now again, this is the ones position. This is the 16s position, this is the 256 position. Again, remember these numbers over here. 1, 16, 256. If we would have had a fourth one, we would say it's 496. So this is 7 times 256 plus, now E is the same as 14. So this is 14 times 16. And 2 goes in the 1's position. So seven times 256, let me get a calculator out for this one because I'm not that amazing, is 1792. All right, I lost my cursor, there we go. 1792 plus 14 times 16 is 224. And two times one is two. If we add, all these numbers together, 1792 plus 224 plus 2, we're going to get 2018. Oh, had I made that a 4, it would have been 2020. All right, and then finally, let's go the other way. Let's say we have a decimal number. Let's use the decimal 3000, okay? And we want to write that into a, des into a hexadecimal notation. So first off, you need to see where does 3,000 go. It doesn't, it doesn't fit between 1 and 16. 3,000 does not fit between 16 and 256. 3,000 does fit between 40 and 96 and 256. So we're not going to use 40 and 96 because it's too big. So I need to find out how many 256s fit with inside of 3,000. If you take 3,000 and divide it by 256, we're going to get 11.7 and, and some leftovers. So the biggest thing is, is it fits 11 times. And 11 is letter B in hexadecimal. Now I got to see what's left over. So I need to take 3,000 minus, and I need to determine what is 11 times 256. So if I take 11 times 256, that's 2816. If I subtract that, I get a 184. Now I need to keep going and look at this one. 184, uh, that would fit between 
16 and 256. 256 is too big. So I need to figure out how many 16s fit in 184. So 184 divided by 16 is 11.5. I just care about 11. I don't care about my 0.5 and I need to see what's left. So 184 minus, if I take 11 times 16, that's 176, and this would be an eight. An eight fits in between one and 16. Obviously eight goes into one, excuse me, one goes into eight, eight times. So eight is what we're gonna use. So this would represent B, B, eight. Hey, look at that. We just, uncra we just cracked the code. I love you 3000 from Avengers and BB-8 from Star Wars. Oh, Disney rules them all. Okay, good job. All right, so anyway, that would be BB-8 in hexadecimal notation. Like I said, you're welcome to go to YouTube, Google decimal and binary and hexadecimal, and hopefully that will make, uh, if this didn't make enough sense to you, feel free to rewind, go back, or look at some other videos to help you out. So we just mentioned decimal, binary, and hexadecimal. Let's look at some other CPU features. Uh, some other CPU features are multi-core CPUs, where you have multiple CPUs and a single chip. You can have two to eight separate cores. If you have two, it's called a dual core. Four would be a quad core. Six is hexacore, and eight is octacore. The more cores that you have inside of a CPU, the more powerful it is. It will increase both pr uh, the processing power and the efficiency. You also have a V CPU. We talked about virtual machines before. A V CPU is a CPU assigned to a virtual system. It's a virtual CPU. Uh, program handling. All CPUs can handle programs differently. Even though a CPU might process an image faster, it could make it very slow with copying a file. So it just depends on the CPU and the computer language in that program. Uh, we wanna make sure that if you're looking for a new computer and you're looking to do a specific purpose on that computer, you wanna find the CPU that best handles that purpose. All right, and finally is cache, and that's how you pronounce C-A-C-H-E, cache. Uh, it is a super fast memory or super fast uh, memory. Yeah, super fast memory to speed up a computer's performance. There are different levels of a cache. You can have L1, L2, and L3. L1 is the smallest and fastest, and each level afterwards, L2 and L3, are a little bit slower. So L1 is the best. The chipset will determine the speed of the motherboard's bus speed. Again, on your motherboard, it has a certain speed that the motherboard can handle called a bus speed, and the chip has its own speed. And you wanna make sure that they don't cancel each other out or limit one over the other. So that is our first main system hardware. The other ones are not as in-depth as that. Uh, the, the different notations took us a little while. But that's the first one called a CPU. It's also the chip. Again, it's inserted into a motherboard. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is a CPU, uh, another CPU feature called power and heat management. Now, power and heat management will uh, really, it, it depends on how fast your, your computer is working and how hard your CPU is working, it will let off a lot of heat. There's two main enemies to a computer. You have heat and you have moisture or wetness. And heat is one of the biggest things that can slow a computer down. So the harder that your computer is working, the more heat your CPU is emitting from it. And that heat can be really detrimental to your computer. So we have these things called power and heat management. There's a couple of different ways that you can cool your CPU. Uh, and one is passive cooling and one is active cooling. Now, the main difference between the words of passive and active is passive means it has no moving parts. Active means it does have moving parts. So we're going to talk about both. Passive cooling, it does not use power or any mechanical parts. It uses something called a heat sink. And a heat sink is what you can see pictured here is uh, it uses a heat sink which transfers heat from the CPU into the air. And then typically on a computer, you see fans that are on the outside edges of a computer and that push the air out. Whenever you turn on a computer, you, you mostly hear a fan starting up. 
that's the noise that it's going to be making. And that fan is to push that hot air out of the system so it's gone and it doesn't uh, disrupt any activities that are happening within. This passive cooling is fine. It is the cheaper of the, all the options that, that are going to be given to us. It is not as effective as some of the other ones, but it will work as a general you know, as a general thing for most computers. Again, it's typically sitting right on top of your uh, CPU. And so it's connected to it through this thermal paste that goes right on it. And then that heat transfers through the thermal paste into the heat sink and that dissipates through the air. The next thing is called active cooling. Active cooling does use electricity and it does have mechanical parts. A couple of different examples of active cooling are either using fans or liquid. Let's talk about fans first. Again, like I talked about a heat sink being strapped straight onto a CPU, which pushes all the heat away from the CPU into the air and the case fans push it out. A fan directly on the CPU is an active cooling uh, option where it's blowing the hot air away from the CPU. This, the heat sink is just this piece of metal that doesn't move or doesn't change, and it just push, it just slowly gives guidance of where the air should go. A fan directly blows it out away from the CPU. And again, it's, th it's thrown into the air, the heat is thrown into the air of the, seat of the computer, and then the case fans push it out. Uh, so a fan is strapped to the CPU and pulls heat away. Liquid cooling is where you actually have liquid coming into the computer passing through or passing, not through, I'm sorry, passing right on or right by the CPU. The, the, the heat from the CPU will heat up the water or heat up the liquid that passes by it. And then it then gets that hot liquid then gets pushed out through another pipe out of the case into a place where it either gets cooled and recycled and brought back in or it's just you know out and new water gets cu comes back in. The liquid is circulated through the system by the CPU pulling heat away. It's actually the most effective cooling method for a CPU, but it does have the most risk, as you could guess, because you are pumping liquid in through a pipe to pass by your CPU, and if something were to happen to that pipe, either on its way in or on its way out, and that liquid escapes the pipe and goes into your CPU, obviously things are not good. As I mentioned, the two main enemies are heat and, and uh, water or heat and moisture, and you're, almost, and you're dealing with both in this case, and both of them could really be bad. But it is the most effective way if it's set up properly and everything's um, the way it should be. Here's an example of, of uh, liquid cooling, as you can see here. You can see that you've got two lines coming in, or two lines going by the CPU. One line goes right into the CPU, and then the other line comes out of the CPU. Cold water comes in, warm water goes out. Uh, and again, it's most effective, but if something were to happen, if you were to bump the system and it breaks a wire, then you're going to have liquid all over the place. So that's the second thing I wanted to talk about. We've got CPUs, and we've got ways to cool the CPU, either with a... Uh, either with a heat sink, which is active cooling, or with a fan or um, liquid cooling, which is an active cooling method. The third type of system hardware I want to talk about is RAM. RAM stands for Random Access Memory. Now, don't get this confused with your hard drive. This is not the same. Uh, RAM is temporary memory, whereas your hard drive obviously is permanent memory. RAM is um, typically these long, thin sticks that are seated perpendicular to a motherboard. If we're talking about a desktop computer, and here's, here's a picture of that, you can see that these long, thin sticks that sit in these little cases and they stand straight up. They don't lay down with the motherboard, they stand straight up with the motherboard, uh, against the motherboard, so it's perpendicular from that. Typically, there's going to be multiple slots for these RAMs, uh, you've got a couple different ways that you, these RAMs can be. Uh, you've got DIMM, which stands for Dual Inline Memory Module. They're typically used in uh, regular PCs, and this is an example of a regular PC. You also have SODIMM, which stands for Small Outline Dual Inline Memory Module, or Small Outline DIMMs. These are smaller versions of RAM. 
They are used in laptops or smaller devices. And typically, because laptops are all about how thin that the laptop can be, usually these RAM do lay down with the motherboard. They're kind of seated in a laying down position compared to the standing up positions of a regular desktop. You have unique slots depending on where what kind of computer that you have because there are a lot of different types of rams and you don't want to put the wrong type in a, in a certain computer so the slot will prohibit the wrong type from being entered in so they have unique slots and typically these rams have little notches in them and you can see here on these pictures if you look the top the top picture is the smaller one that's our so dim for a laptop or, a, or uh, some other mobile smaller device. And the bottom one is a regular DIMM, which is um, for a desktop. And you can see it's got a little notch down where the teeth are. The teeth are kind of the gold area down at the bottom. And the notch is different from both of those. And each one, each, even all the bigger ones, if you have a different size or a different uh, capacity of RAM, they're gonna have different notches depending on what, um, what the speed is or what the technology is of that. So you can only put the certain ones on there. So if you need to know what kind of RAM to get to your computer, you want it to match the ones that are currently in there, or you can look at your, um, you can look at your computer paperwork and decide and figure out which kind that it can handle. Uh, the motherboard will determine the capacity of the RAM. How much that the motherboard, or how much RAM the motherboard can handle will depend on the motherboard. So you wanna look at the literature to find that out. You can have anywhere from one gigabyte all the way to 16 gigabyte. That's the most common. There are some ones outside of that as well, but the more memory that you have, the better performance. By the way, RAM should not be mixed. If you have two different spots or more than two different spots for a RAM stick and you put in a eight gigabit RAM stick into one slot, you better put an eight gigabit RAM stick into another spot. You do not want them to be the different amount. So they should match all the way through. You have a couple different RAM technologies and speeds. Again, as you can see here on these pictures, these are the same length of RAM, but the notches are in a different place. And even if you turn the other one over to make it match the other one, the notch would still be in a different place. So it all depends on what the technology and the speed is. Uh, we, I know on here on this slide, it talks about DDRs. There also is an SDR, which is a single data rate. If you think about a, um, I forget what it's called, that ticking thing that you can put on a, on a piano as you're keeping time, um, and it will just tick, 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 tick to help you keep time and be able to put in the right things. Your computer is the same thing. It operates one tick for each system timer. And that's what a single data rate does, is it, it operates once every time that your system has its own little internal clock, one time per tick. Whereas a DDR is a double data rate and it operates twice per tick of the system timer. And the slots are different for an SDR compared to a DDR, so they can't be mixed. You have DDRs, you have DDR2, DDR3, DDR4. DDR is the slowest and least efficient. And it has a certain amount of pins or teeth on, on your stick. It actually has 140, excuse me, 184 pins. A DDR2 is faster and uses less power than a DDR1, and it has 240 pins. DDR3 is faster and uses less power than a DDR2. It also has a T240 pin, but there's a different notch. Uh, for that one, so they can't be confused. And then finally, a DDR4 is again the fastest of all the DDRs, and it has 288 pins. And there's a way that you can, when you have a virtual computer with a virtual power, there's a way that you can scale up and scale down using um, uh, way, ways that you can increase or decrease the amount of virtual power that uh, your computer uses. All right, so that's the third one. We talked about CPUs. We talked about um, act, uh, power and heat management, and then this was RAM. And the biggest thing to understand about RAM is, again, it is memory, but it's temporary memory. Every time you turn a computer off or restart a computer, it flushes the memory. All of the memory out of the RAM goes away. You wouldn't want that to happen to your hard drive. So your hard drive has permanent memory, permanent storage, whereas a RAM has temporary memory. 
And a lot of times whenever there's a problem with the computer, one of the first things that people say is restart the computer because a lot of times the RAM is the issue and it flushes the RAM clean on a restart and then whatever was going on is not there anymore. So the RAM flushes clean on a restart, obviously a storage of a hard drive, external or internal does not. The fourth one that we're going to talk about is a motherboard. We've mentioned this before, but this is what the chip goes into. This is what your RAM goes into. So this motherboard provides connectivity among the hardware. All the different things that you're plugging into the computer, whether it's the RAM, whether it's the chip, whether it's a USB cord, whether it's a uh, VGA or some sort of monitor device that you're plugging into your computer, you're actually plugging it into a motherboard. The motherboard covers the entire spread of the computer and any outside port that you plug things into is automatically getting pl plugged into the motherboard. It's connecting all of the hardware together. Now there's three different form factors on this, which is a various shape or size. And as you can see, I've got three different shapes on this picture here. One is the ATX. The ATX is the full-size motherboard, typically for larger desktops. You have a micro ATX, which is a motherboard for smaller systems, and you have a mini ITX, which is a tiny motherboard for smaller specialty systems. Motherboard features, uh, they can, again, each motherboard can support a certain type of CPU, whether it be an Intel CPU, an a AMD CPU, so you just have to be careful on what you're plugging into your computer. And as you can see here on this motherboard, this right here is where the chip would go. There's actually no chip right now, but that is where it would go into the motherboard slot. And then something is typically right on top of that for the cooling feature. It also can only handle a certain type of RAM. It only supports specific RAM types. So you need to know, not brand, but a certain type in terms of the size or speed. Is it a DDR? Is it an SDR? Is it a four gig RAM stick? Is it an eight gig RAM stick? And it will only handle a certain amount. So you wanna make sure you look at your literature so you know what kind of CPU that it needs. If you're building a computer, what kind of CPU and what kind of RAM. Built-in components, a lot of motherboards come built in with an audio and a video and a network support, uh, and they have it already an audio or a video card installed, but some people want a really nicer video card, so then they would replace it. But it does come built in with some features, so if you just wanted bare basics, you don't have to go out and buy one. It's already built into the motherboard. Expansion slots is really nice. These can add other components to the motherboard and they are ready for any kind of future items or products. There's a USB slot typically in every motherboard right now because a lot of new things that would be created that haven't been created yet would use USB. So it's gonna be able to read anything that can be built now or later on. But it has all these built-in expansion slots and we're gonna get into the expansion slots later on in a different chapter. Firmware is a setup program stored on a chip to update the motherboard. Now this is not the same chip as what we're talking about with CPU. It's a different type of chip that you would put in the, the firmware into, and it basically makes sure that your motherboard is up to date and it knows what it needs to do. And finally, special features are other things that you could put into this motherboard. Uh, it could have additional storage. It could have some security measures, some hardware assistance. There's a lot of other things that a motherboard can, uh, can feature. The last thing that we need to talk about is our power supply, also called PSU, power supply unit. So we've talked about four things up to this point. This is the fifth and final one. Now your power supply is what allows your computer to actually work. Most, I mean all desktop computers need to be plugged in. Some laptops don't have to because it's got a battery in it, but the battery does need to be charged. It needs to be plugged in every now and then. So here's what's basically happening. Your power supply, which looks like this picture over here, it's got, uh, over here, it's got a fan that, again, keeps it cool. And then here's where you would plug it in. If you plug in something into the wall, it would plug into the computer right here. That supplies power into all these different cords, which then plug into different parts of your motherboard. Some of them would support your hard drive. Some of them would support your, uh, your uh, cooling fan. Some of them would support a um, uh, an audio card, your video card. It just depends on what you have going on. But, uh, but all of them, uh, your computer needs power and this is how it supplies the power. Your outlets that you're plugging things into 
are AC, alternating current. However, your computer wants DC. So this power supply unit converts the AC power coming into it into AC, excuse me, into DC power that your computer needs. Now a typical outlet has anywhere from uh, 110 to 120 volts of power coming in. Your computer only needs 2 to 12 volts. So obviously, if without this power supply unit, your computer would be fried. It would have too much electricity coming in. So this power supply unit has a couple different purposes. Um, it converts AC to DC, and it decreases the voltage to the exact amounts needed from 110 down to just 2 to 12 volts of what it specifically needs. <clears throat> Each one of these different colored wires that come out of the power, uh, power supply um, is, represents a different voltage supplied to that component. So it's nice and color-coded in that way. But there's specific connections for the motherboard, there's specific connections for the um, other, com other hardware that goes into the motherboard that you might possibly need. So the PSU is, again, Two main purposes is what you need to know. It converts AC to DC, and it lowers or decreases the voltage to the exact amounts needed. And again, the different colored wires represent different voltage amounts. And then on a laptop, you don't have a power supply unit because you're not constantly plugged in, but you do have a brick or a portable power supply unit that's outside of the computer instead of inside the computer, and this is what you use to charge your computer or to keep it running when it's low on batteries. It also does the same thing. It converts AC to DC, and it lowers the voltage. It, the, the brick on the cord itself does the conversion. All right, so that's it with Chapter 2. Um, like we did last time, let's look at some review questions. You're welcome to go back and review anything that we've talked about, but let's look, look at some review questions to cover what chapter two was on, which is system hardware. So here's some chapter two review questions. Uh, which of these, <clears throat> excuse me, which of these is not part of the data processing sequence? A, networking, B, processing, C, output, D, input. As we mentioned at the very beginning of the video, there's a three-step process, and that is to, it goes into the computer, it works on the, the, the data, and then it outputs our information, and that's input, processing, and output. So of these, option A, networking, is not the part of the data processing sequence. Number two, what is another name for a CPU? A, microprocessor, B, Intel, C, system memory, D, chipset. A, microprocessor. That is the chip that goes in the motherboard. Number three, which of these is not a feature of a CPU? A, multi-core, B, 64-bit processing, C, L1 cache, D, DDR. The only one that's not a feature of a CPU in this case is the DDR. DDR had to do with RAM, the random access memory sticks. All the rest of them were all part of a feature of CPU. Number four, why is passive cooling not usually used for a CPU? A, draws too much power. B, not effective enough. C, moving parts break down. D, uses too much RAM. Passive cooling is usually not used for a CPU, or the reason that it wouldn't be used is because it's not effective enough. Remember the most effective one? I'm not going to say because... We're going to go to question five. Number five, what is the main advantage of liquid cooling over air cooling? A, less expensive. B, safer. C, more effective. D, uses less power. And that would be more effective. Sorry, I kind of gave it away. Uh, it does not use less power. It is not safer because, again, there's a risk involved. It's actually more expensive, but it is more effective. Number six, in what type of computer is SODIMM memory used? A, laptop, B, desktop, C, server, D, smartphone. SODIMM stood for small outline, dual inline memory module, and that was used in the smaller devices such as a laptop. 
Number seven, in what two ways are DDR3 DIMMs better than DDR2 DIMMs? We are choosing two answers here. A, less expensive. B, more reliable. C, uses less power. D, faster. DDR, remember each successive level of DDR was always better in two ways. It was faster and it used less power. So we're looking at C and D. Eight, you are reconfiguring a cloud virtual machine with additional vCPUs and additional RAM. What term best descri describes your actions? A, scaling down. B, scaling in. D, excuse me, C, scaling up. D, scaling out. Since we are adding on additional vCPUs and adding on additional RAM, we are actually making it more. We're putting more in there. So we're scaling, in this case, since we're adding, we're scaling up. You either are going to be scaling up, which increases everything that's going on, or scaling down, which decreases everything. You're taking things away, but in this case, we're adding things in. Number nine, what manages and controls the speed of a motherboard's buses? A, RAM, B, CPU, C, chipset, D, L1 cache. Now, one thing I didn't talk about as much is that a motherboard has a speed. A chip has a speed. And a motherboard's speed is controlled by two chips. You have a chip set. You have a Northbridge chip and you have a Southbridge chip. And this chip set will control and the speed of the motherboard. 10, what are the two functions of a desktop PC's power supply? Choose two, A, steps down the voltage, B, increases the voltage, C, converts AC to DC, D, converts DC to AC. We just mentioned this. There were two things that a desktop's PSU did, or a power supply, it stepped down the voltage and it converted AC to DC, A and C. And finally, number 11, what is the reason for different colored wires on a power supply? A, the wire color determines the appropriate component for the connector. B, each wire color represents a different voltage. C, certain color wires deliver AC power and certain ones DC power. D, certain color wires deliver higher quality powers than others. The reason for the different color wires is because each wire color represents a different voltage. All right, and that's it for chapter two. Thanks for joining us with, um, thanks for joining us for chapter two system hardware. Feel free to review this at your own disposal. Let me know down below in comments if you have any questions or any concerns or anything you wanna add. I'm happy to answer your questions or read through your comments as best as I can for future videos. Thank you, and as always, keep on keeping on. Have a great day.